the kind organizers here asked me to talk about evolve or die, sort of a morbid uh, subject. Uh, but if you were here uh, for Max's presentation, he talks a lot about the K through 12 version of evolution. And um, I'm not gonna bore you with the, 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 the facts of, of how the world's changing, right? It's no doubt that this industry in particular has almost two centuries of inertia. And every business right now is being transformed, whether you're in automobiles or, or um, education. The world is moving at an astounding pace, but yet the inertia of education is still uh, shockingly the same. And there is um, a, a book written by a, a gentleman named Ari de Geis. Ari was a, uh, a strategist for Royal Dutch Shell. And in 1997, I was actually still in high school, Ari wrote a book called The Living Company. And Ari was fascinated by why do some organizations last for centuries or longer, whereby most of the companies that were being built even in the mid and late 90s were only lasting 10 years, 12 years, 18 years on average. And Ari came to one conclusion. The only long-term sustainable advantage for any business is to be a learning organization, to constantly be evolving, to be transforming with the macroeconomics, with the changes that are part of the world. This industry is one that's been seeing, is, is one that has been sitting waiting for them to happen. And we'll talk about some of the macro trends that are driving a lot of these changes. But before we, uh, before we get going there, um, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to use uh, Slido yet, but uh, I, wanted to get, I wanted to do a couple quick polls, and Zeke just switched it over here, and I definitely want to leave some time to answer a bunch of questions. But first off, let's do a little poll, and I don't know if everyone can get, has Slido up and running real quick. I'd love to get a little interaction with who the audience is. So this is sort of a quick poll of who's, I love it, entrepreneur, investor, any faculty here? We got a woo. Maybe if you're not if you're not able to get on Slido, how many people are students? All right, we have a student. Let's see where let's see where uh, where it goes. I've actually had the pleasure of presenting for the last five years um, in front of lots of organizations, and many, regardless of what your you know faculty, entrepreneur, investor, um, I've asked who considers themselves an entrepreneur. So just a quick show of hand, who in this room considers themselves an entrepreneur? I love it. Um, when I first started asking that question five years ago, that was most of the room. Um, the world has fundamentally changed, and entrepreneur isn't just um, the, the white privileged guy that creates an app and makes a billion dollar. And entrepreneurship is for everybody. It's about being a creative, resourceful individual. And the world needs empowered and engaged entrepreneurs that want to change it. I have one more quick poll. All right, let's get, a, let's get a little tabulation of how well educated, traditionally educated we are. Holy cow. Um, so I think basically everyone here probably has some level of post-secondary education, right? Most? Looks like it. 1%. Who has who not graduated from college? Just show of hands. Probably because you just haven't yet. <laughs> um, Awesome. Switch me back to slides. Thanks for uh, um, humoring me. So like, um, like all of you, um, uh, I followed that traditional path. And as well as galvanized, right now most of our students have some level of post-secondary education. So the large majority of our students have followed a traditional path and ended up in one of two places, or one of three places, underemployed, underemployed, or a category I invented called the unhappily employed. And, um, and I'm not gonna fill everybody about, again, about the facts of the tech wage gap um, and all the challenges that are within them. There's been a lot of great books that hopefully you've all read and some that I've read. So Kevin Carey wrote an awesome book about the end of college and he prefaced that we're all gonna be working towards badges and we're all gonna have these credentials and badges. And I don't know if that really has played out. But he does end on an amazing note and talks about the lifelong learning. And I don't know if anybody finished the book, 
but he, he builds the analogy between the humanities learning and a lifelong education. And what's the older than the oldest European education institution, the longest learning organiza organized learning organization ever? And he says it's religion. And how often do you participate in your religion? You don't go to your religion for just a period of your life and walk away, or sometimes you do. But you go to the temple or church, et cetera, you go every week. And Sal Khan wrote in a, a great book about the One World Schoolhouse and, and talks about his ideas behind Khan Academy. And he recently uh, built a, a physical school. But the old version of education was a, a, an intellectual pursuit for the, for the elite. And um, Michael Crow just wrote a great book about the new American university and really drives home the point that the degree is one of the most stratifying, perpetuating layers for the privilege. That only the privileged typically can get it, and it keeps the privilege perpetuating. And one of my most favorite books, um, more recently, is an author named Bill Darowitz. He wrote a book called um, Excellent Sheep, The Miseducation of, the, uh, of, America's, uh, of America. And he talks about how we're all going through this system. We're walking through this system, following the rules, and we all end up of one of four industries, finance, law, med, or consulting. And people are just doing school. They're not being taught to be creative. And the, and the amounts of uh, depression inside of these higher institutions is astounding by his measure. So let's get on a, a happy note here and talk about um, why we're all here. We're all here to, because we care about education. And this event is a great convening event where we all come together to learn. We bring together people from disparate resources, from, from different backgrounds, um, from different industries, from different perspectives to coalesce, um, or dare I say, galvanize um, for the opportunity to learn. And that was one of the, the uh, things that came to mind upon my journey that kind of brought me to, to coming up with the idea behind Galvanize, about coalescing this melting pot of learning from individual to individual and building these nodes of individuals that can learn from each other, where working and learning were synonymous, that we didn't separate learning into this ivory tower infrastructure and, and be lectured in a passive environment, but in this constructivist environment where industry and academia were actually inside the same context. So this was the path, right? We were all told to work hard in high school, get the best grades so we can get into the best school. And then that degree would create the signaling to industry that we were awesome, that we were employable. And hopefully some of you have been to some of the sessions that talked about mastery of competencies and things like that. But this path, like most of us in this room, we all followed it. And we all hopefully ended up where we wanted to. But I didn't. In 1996, February of 1996, if anybody's old enough to remember, there was a great Time Magazine cover story. Anybody remember who was on that Time Magazine, 1996? It was a Mark Andreessen full of hair. I had hair back then, too. Um, it was called The Golden Geeks, and it was all about the gold rush of these crazy entrepreneurs in the tech age, right? Mark was behind Netscape. And I remember I was sitting in the back of my economics, advanced economics class at DePaul University going, holy cow, I got to get out of here. I need to be part of this revolution. This is going on, and I'm sitting here being lectured about Schumpeter, which is intellectually curious and interesting. But I want to go change the world. I want to go build something. I want to go make something. And this guy, Mark Andreessen, represent the future. I knew technology was going to represent the future, and I wanted to be part of it. But I followed it. I stayed in school. I graduated with my, with my two degrees. But then I did something bold, something sort of a generation ahead of, uh, of my time, which is really representing what's happening in this generation now. But I, I finished my two degrees in, in, in Chicago. I studied economics, and I had a degree in entrepreneurship. And uh, I moved to Colorado. I moved to Denver. I didn't know a soul. I didn't know anybody. Um, all I knew was I wanted to build a lifestyle before I built and chose just a career. And, but I used my degree. It served me well, like it probably served most of us well back then. And, and it did. And it got me a job. I ended up getting a job at a software company, sitting in a cubicle, 
and I hated it. The best part of my day was riding my bicycle back home from, from this company. And I realized that the only way I was going to have the opportunity and freedom to do what I wanted to do, I was going to have to go make my own path. And this was 20 years ago, before it was cool to be an entrepreneur, before there were accelerators, before there were thousands and thousands of angel investors out there ready to write you a check. So maybe not so much in this environment, but um, I had to do it the hard way. And I quit. And I know it sounds a bit cliche, but I started my first company in the basement of a house in Washington Park in Denver, Colorado. And I failed miserably. And I learned unbelievable lessons, and I started another one. And um, that one did OK. And then I started another one. And that one did really well. And, and I was on my way. And upon my last organization, which actually takes me uh, back to Austin, Texas. So my last company was a firm called Ascendant Technology. Ascendant was uh, a global systems integrator. We focused on building skill sets. We had some of the best consultants in the world. In fact, we had 1,000 job engineers. Our headquarters were based here. We had about 200 employees in Austin, Texas, but we had over 1,000 across four continents. And if you're in that industry, you have two choices. You have to be the premium provider or the low-cost provider. And if you're going to be the premium provider, the only way you can charge a premium is you have to have skills that nobody else has. You have to be able to do something and provide a skill set that no one else has in the marketplace. So in 2006, when the market was getting hot again, we built our own five-month Java school, teaching people Java and very specific specialized school. So in many regards, it was kind of the first coding boot camp, if you will. But I was in the organic talent business. Long story short, in 2012, I sold that business to Avnet. And upon selling it, I really wanted to do two things. I wanted to ride my bike more, spend more time with my children, but I wanted to figure out a mechanism to empower more people to solve the problem that I had. And I discovered this crazy thing going on. I called it an urban entrepreneurial renaissance. So I sold my company. I have this, I'm going to hang out with my kids. I'm going to write angel checks and ride my bike. So I'm going to change the world. I'm going to find amazing entrepreneurs. I'm going to coach them, mentor them, and write them checks. I write six checks, and I realize that there's no scale to being an angel investor. If you want to change the world, how do you empower thousands, maybe tens of thousands, or, or dare I say millions of people? And certainly, I wasn't going to do it one check at a time, and I was already out of bandwidth in terms of my ability to mentor and coach them. And basically, what I, as I wrote a few of these checks in Denver, I, I couldn't believe all these entrepreneurs coming out of the woodwork. There basically was an entire human population, the largest generation ever, the millennial generation, came of employment age. At the exact same time, we had the Great Recession. And at the exact same time, the maturity and complete tech ubiquity came of age. When I mean tech ubiquity, I mean the access to compute power was unlimited. Right? When I started my first software company in 1998, we actually bought servers. We bought bandwidth. The barriers in physical infrastructure and capital was very expensive, and the barriers were high. Now, there are no barriers. Any company can be disrupted. Any person, whether they're sitting in the coffee shop around the corner or in Detroit or Denver or Dubai, anybody has access to the same compute power. Your only limiting factors are your own ingenuity and your access your access to other people that can teach you, mentor you, or give you access to industry and capital. And I started using this word galvanize. Who's going to coalesce this? Who's going to turn this into a system and a multiplier for more entrepreneurs, for more engineers? Because anybody who's ever built a great company, a tech company, or now any company, you have to have more talent. And that was a limiting factor. So one of my co-founders and I, who's sitting in the audience, we went and bought a building in Denver. We bought a 30,000-foot building. And we launched a campus. And we had this crazy idea of using, using community, curriculum, and capital to build a 21st century school. And it worked. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. But let's get back to some of these macro uh, changes. And um, <laughs> I forgot that that's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, uh, as we said, right, the world has fundamentally changed. We're working with 100-year-old insurance companies that are now software companies. I don't know if anyone's seen GE's awesome, com kitschy commercials right, right now. GE is the largest industrial company in the world, and they're working to become a software company. 
they're launching a platform, an Internet of Things platform called Predix, that they hope to be the 15th, right now they consider themselves the 15th largest software company, they want to be the fifth by 2020. Goldman Sachs, a financial services institution, they have more software engineers than Facebook has employees. Everybody is a tech company. The tectonic shift to digital literacy and now data literacy, if you are not a software company or don't realize you are a software company, you will die. And that is a fact. And it's happening as any industry is getting completely reinvented by sensors, data, connectivity, unlimited compute power that's pretty much on the pennies. Anybody can build anything. Anyone can disrupt any industry now. And that's fundamentally a completely different world than what we used to live in. So at Galvanize, we had this idea, what if we actually started with the end in mind? What if we actually sat down with some of these large organizations and reverse engineered education and built a model that was able to keep pace with industry? So we would sit down with actuaries from, from insurance companies and data scientists from Facebook and, uh, and build a 21st century model that was sort of what I've been calling the last mile of education. Anybody that is privileged enough to afford a humanities-based education that can go away for four years, that is wonderful. And we built some amazing partnerships with them. We want to be that connection, that last mile that moves you to this skills-based economy, this skills-based world. We are fundamentally in a skills-based economy and a skills-based world. And that degree, that piece of paper that used to signal how awesome we were, is broken, broken down. So at Ascendant, my last company, I would estimate I probably have hired more than 1,000 engineers in my career. And there was a direct correlation that, unfortunately, the more academic you were, the less likely you could be successful as a consultant. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that that signaling didn't matter. I haven't looked at someone's resume in 14 years. Because in the competency-based world, in the skills-based world, you're looking for experience. And in the tech world, specifically, it's very obvious whether you have the skills or not. There's things like GitHub now, where it's a code repository. We look at your code. We look at what you've written, what you've done. How well do you know HTML5? Do you know JavaScript? Do you know Node? Do you know Mongo? Do you know SQL? At what level do you know these competencies? These are competency-based things that every technical organization that's hiring engineers around the world is looking to understand. And a, and a piece of paper that says the college you went to in your name and the school that you attended doesn't tell us anything about your mastery of any sort of competencies. It doesn't tell me how well you work on teams or how well you collaborate. And this last mile is where we are really sitting in between helping individuals complete the skills and mastery and show and demonstrate competencies that employers like IBM, like Allstate, again, 100-year-old insurance companies, as well as the tech elite, Facebook, Asana, Uber, Airbnb, are employing. So I want to posit a different idea, a different sort of concept of learning. And we have this idea of breaking it down into the learner's journey. And instead of community curriculum and capital shaping this wonderful ecosystem, this melting pot for learning, what if we actually broke it down into three phases? Curiosity, committed, and then continuous. Curiosity should be free, right? And if you go even the traditional system, we should be free to explore. Part of our youth is about exploring what we're interested in. We used to call that word vocation. And I hate to make another religious analogy, but what is my calling? How do I have the freedom to explore? And if you have the ability to go explore at a school for four years, that's wonderful to taste different things and find out what's interested you and explore and find your passions and find what is meaningful and purposeful to you in life. But that's even not what we're doing, right? If you believe what Darowitz is saying, he's pumping out people to industries that are creating awful, miserable, unhappy sheep. That's not a world we want to live in that find in four industries, and then they come to us unhappily employed. 
So curiosity should be free. It should happen online. It happens on Codecademy. It should happen in traditional education opportunities where people can develop the whole man. People can explore the humanities and find their calling. And once they do, they come to a committed or an immersive program, the last mile of education, that gives them very specific job-ready skills that employers are demanding. And then, how do we shift the burden to continuous learning to industry? So I'm sure you've all heard this before across this event. The idea that we go away for four, four years and get an education and we're done learning the lust of our lives and have employment for the rest of our lives are over. They're done. The, the generation that came of employment age during the Great Recession, during this urban entrepreneurial renaissance, I think Mary Meeker from Kleiner says they'll have more than 17 jobs over their lifetime. 17 jobs. How in the world do you, are you prepared to have 17 jobs unless you have the ability to constantly learn, to create this lifelong journey agile mindset and be prepared and have the ability or have employers that can invest in you over and over and over. There was a great Harvard Business Review article that came out two weeks ago, and it said, if you want to attract the best talent, offer learning, not just dollars. So the best employers in the world, the best companies in the world, are all fighting for the best talent. They're all understanding that the Girl Scouts can also take credit cards, and everybody is a tech company, and everyone is si sitting in a cafe, has the same access to compute power, and is ready to eat their lunch. They want the best talent, and if they're going to keep the best talent, they're going to invest in their continuous learning. Because what we're doing today will not be what we're doing in a very short period of time from now. And how do you go down the specialization? So if somebody gives you an on-ramp that gives you the fundamental skills to land you your first job, like what we do with our six-month full-stack software engineering job, you're not done learning. You're not done fulfilling your craft. You might want to specialize in DevOps. You might want to specialize in front-end and JavaScript. You might want to go down into a, a, an arena of product management. Who's going to invest in those skills? I believe industry is going to continue to finance more and more of the continuous learning. And the transformation and speed by which technologies are being adopted is astounding. The cloud computing power that started in the startup world and the consumer side has entered the enterprise. And all these organizations are trying to figure out how they modernize their skills. If you're going to put in new compute infrastructure, you must figure out how to modernize the skills that are necessary to work on them. So just one, for instance, just to nerd out for a minute, there's an enterprise container software a technology called Docker. Docker is now widely common across all enterprises. Anybody want to tell me how long Docker has been around? Like literally, how long has a company been around from inception? Two years. Two years. And two years from now, it'll be something else. This is a game, an industry, that moves at an astounding pace. And how do you build a model, an organizational model, where you can reinvent your curriculum at the pace of industry changing? So in 2012, when we announced our first class, we taught a technology called Ruby and Rails was the infrastructure. That was sort of the hot technology du jour that a lot of employers wanted. Today, if you're in our programs, we teach zero Ruby or Rails. It's all Node and JavaScript based now. And that, the, this cat and mouse game never, ever ends. The cat never, ever chases the mouse. So I think it's only appropriate to tell the story through um, the lenses. So as I described, a lot of the folks we d have had as students have come in, come in through our program through one of three categories. And I have an example of each. This is uh, one of our first students. Her name was Jennifer. Um, she was actually um, on unemployment with a high school degree only when she entered our program. She had no zero background in terms of how to be a web developer or software engineer. And after our six-month program, she makes $85,000 working for a Brooklyn-based nonprofit in downtown Denver. We have fundamentally changed her life forever. This is another awesome young woman named Elaine. This one's kind of funny. She falls into the underemployed category. Elaine has a computer science degree from the University of Illinois. That's a pretty good school, right? And uh, so I spent a lot of time with Elaine. I said, Elaine, why are you here? She says, I understand a ton of theory, but if you go and look at my code, 
I don't know how to code for shit. I don't know anything about writing really clean code. I don't know anything about continuous agile development methodologies. And I'm in this horrible consulting company getting paid very little, and I feel like I'm stuck. Elaine went through our program, and she works for a company called Pivotal Labs. Um, Pivotal Labs is, is sort of the Navy SEALs of software engineers. Um, and she makes well over six figures. In fact, um, Pivotal has offices on our campuses, so I still see Elaine quite a bit on one of our Denver, uh, Denver campuses. This is Kareem. Kareem has got the Ivy League pedigree. Lived in Washington, D.C., was making over $100,000 a year, and he moved to uh, Colorado to go to our software engineering program. And of course, said, Kareem, why in the world are you here? And he's like, I hate it in my life. I was stuck in a cubicle. I want to be empowered to be part of this tech industry and tech company. And um, he wanted to be in the financial services industry in Manhattan in a tech startup. And we were able to produce that outcome for, for Kareem. And um, we align our interests entirely with our students. We only consider ourselves successful if we enable the outcome for our students. And very specifically, our team works tirelessly with industry to make sure we're building what industry wants, producing a subscription level of capable talent, and also empowering that individual to be very well suited uh, to be successful and continue to grow. I want to make sure we save lots of time for for uh, questions. And this is our big dream, our big mission. We believe that there should be an on-ramp to upward mobility that is diverse, that allows people to explore for curiosity, that they have the privilege to go to higher ed institutions. But anybody should have access, anybody with ambition and aptitude should be able to achieve upward mobility. And that path today is not just a piece of paper. It is creating your own business, and it is somewhere at level of software or digital literacy. We've spent a great deal of time forging some very unique partnerships. Um, we work with the University of New Haven, where we run a fully accredited master's degree in data science program. We're working with several other um, great institutions under the uh, U.S. Department of Education's EQIP program, where we can continue to own that last mile of education to take people from anywhere they might have come, whether they were a cello player, a poker player, a computer science degree major, or a liberal arts major from some other institution. We want to provide that last mile of education that allows them to be successful, and hopefully we will be their continuous learning partner as their learning journey continues for the rest of their life. Thank you very much, and I'd love to answer um, anyone's questions. Should I just jump to the first one since it's upvoted? How do you transition from developer or educator to entrepreneur? Is that um, a personal question or a generic question about anybody? I'll answer, I guess I'll answer it from uh, uh, of, of both perspectives. Um, I clearly didn't grow up as a, an edu educator. I'm an entrepreneur, and I think everybody today, if they want to be successful, needs to be an entrepreneur. And for those that want to be in the music industry here in Austin, Texas, if you want to be a successful musician today, you're going to need to be an entrepreneur. And entrepreneurs come in many, many fashions. If you like Linda Roderman's book from Endeavor, she talks about all the different flavors of entrepreneur. For me, an entrepreneur is any creative, resourceful person. And I don't know a company on this planet that isn't trying to hire creative, resourceful people. And those that are constantly reinventing themselves are the most uh, interesting and most successful. How does Galvanize compare to other coding boot camps like Hack Reactor, Hack Bright, Make School, General Assembly, et cetera? That's a great question. There has been a massive proliferation of, uh, of boot camps over the, uh, the last sort of four, four years, I guess, now. And, um, and that's a good thing, because we think there should be more access. So first and foremost, we are the longest code school of all of them. Um, from the very beginning in the fall of 2012, we launched a one-of-a-kind 24-week, six-month program. So we are the longest school by 2x of any of the schools. Our goal was for those 
that are committed to join our school, we want it to be the elite Harvard school, sort of the people's MIT, I said. You don't, we want to be the best, but not elitist. And we literally can take people like Jen, who have zero experience, and teach them all the way through to successful beginner. And in 12 weeks, I simply don't think that's enough time. I personally have experience doing this from across my career. And to take a beginner and truly teach somebody from the beginning, you need at least six months of very immersive um, education. Um, additionally, Galvanize runs the full stack experience. If you walk into our 75,000 square foot campus at First and Howard in South of Market, San Francisco, when you walk in the cafe from the barista, that's us. The faculty, that's us. The curriculum, that's us. The employers on the campus and the employment relationships, those are us. We control the entire full stack relationships and run seven massive urban campuses across Denver, Boulder, Seattle, San Francisco, uh, Austin, Texas next, next week. And we've only focused on building the primacy of learning. We run full-time on-campus programs for data scientists and software engineers. And we've been truly committed to that. And we run at a 97% placement rate on our software engineering program and 94% placement rate on our data science program. Um, the ability to execute that at scale, we will teach um, somewhere, we'll teach about 1,600 to 1,700 students across all of our campuses. And we have assembled one of the most interesting brain trusts of data science faculty and uh, software engineering faculty in the world, where we don't just have practitioners. These folks come from deep education backgrounds as well. And that's the, the dirty little secret about education, right? It's hard. Everybody learns differently. And it's one thing to go to a 12-week program and take that Dartmouth CS major and turn them into great people, like my Elaine example. Most people don't come with Elaine's computer science degree. Most come with zero um, computer science or technical background whatsoever. To truly teach somebody not to just level them up or top them off is very, very hard work. And we're very proud of our stats and, and what we are creating there. Do you think corporations or universities will drive the future of higher education? Will the demand for the traditional degrees go away? I do, I think both, right? The world has changed, but I think ultimately the pull of industry will force things to change. And obviously there's two big, there's two big pulls of the world. There's the free hand of the, of, the, of the economy that will be a pull. And then you also have policy that creates uh, circumstances both potentially positive or negative like the EQIP program. But I certainly think industries demand. I mean, most of the time, industry was what changed the world, right? From the agrarian era and the land grant schools that were created in the late 1800s to the court, sort of billionaires of the industrial age, if you will, that saw the opportunity, the Carnegie's, to build the next level of workforce. And there will be more industry pioneers that step up to build the 21st century school, like Galvanize is. So I do think you will have multiple drivers that will pull this. And the demand for traditional degrees go away. If you get into Harvard or, or, or MIT or Stanford, no. But of the 4 million students trying to enroll this year, about 15,000 get into those schools, right? So I do think the signaling of the degree and very, very progressive companies are getting away from that. Laszlo Block, the chief people officer for Google, wrote a great book called uh, Work Rules. And they have data-driven evidence. They are a very data-driven company that proves that an Ivy League student is not the most successful um, employee at Google. And he is rewriting the book. They are a very progressive employer on that bell curve. But even Ernst & Young, last week in the Huffington Post in the UK, said an uh, entry-level job no longer is a degree required. There is no evidence they will be more successful than anybody else. The Wall Street Journal just three weeks ago did a whole study that said the wages between somebody that went to an elite school and anyone in the STEM field that acquired their skills elsewhere, there is no income difference at all, whether you got your degree in the tech field from some elite school versus you built your skills somewhere else, you end up at the same pay. I do think the degree is losing its influence. Um, but Nirvana is being able to get the skills and the degree. But I don't believe it's the insurance card that we once thought it was. I don't think it's the, the perfect path. Um, it served a lot of us well, but I don't think it will serve the generation that's coming of age in a more fractionalized, skills-based economy. I think people will be looking for more mastery of competencies, more constructivist, more project-based learning that demonstrates a soft skill heuristic and competencies that um, 
higher ed will evolve and work to, and we hope to be partnering with a lot of these um, uh, progressive schools, which is, which is already happening. How long until your traditional higher, until traditional higher ed implodes from disruption and inertia? What should boards and CEOs be doing now to become the higher ed, <laughs> uh, not to become the higher ed rust belt? Um, you know, an industry that has hundreds of years of inertia, it's really hard to break to break down. So I don't, you know, just five years ago, we said MOOCs were going to put all schools out of business, right? We were all going to learn online. And, um, and content delivery mechanisms, whether it's online or on a book, is not the same, right? We are still humans. We learn best from human to human interaction. And it's one thing to acquire skills. It's another thing to actually have access. So if you're the most brilliant autodidact in the world, you can teach yourself anything on Khan Academy or Code Academy or Treehouse or at your public library. Who's going to open up a door and get you an interview and get you a job? Until we're, until we're you know, not part cyborg, we can't outsource our relationships in these human-to-human -human interactions. So I don't think schools are going, going to go away anytime soon. I do think we will move more freely about how we get our skill sets and competencies. I think we should have more time to explore curiosity at a younger age. I think a lot of higher ed institutions will adapt and evolve to and provide more um, more flexibility than the four-year bundled degree. So I applaud those like, I mean, Michael Crow, who I cite in his book, ASU is doing a lot of progressive things uh, to adapt, and I do think there's opportunities for partnership between the last mile of education and a lot of the traditional institutions that want to partner in the ways that we can build things that they can't, and we certainly aren't going to build things that have been built by a lot of great institutions out there. What systems or supports have you put in place so that access to Galvanize is equitable across socioeconomic lines? That's a great question. So when we launched, uh, we were the longest program, and we, we are the most expensive program. So we charge $21,000, and it's six months for, for our, flagship, our flagship program. What a lot of folks don't know what we did in that first program is um, as a, you know, a startup company, we actually financed a lot of the students ourselves by deferring their tuition, meaning we completely aligned our interests with our students. We said, pay us what you can, we'll teach you, and once we get you a job, you can pay us $200 a month until you pay off your fees. Additionally, we went to all the top employers in the area and said, who wants to sponsor scholarships for any of these students um, that can come in? And we provide, so uh, Jen, who I showed in that first exa example, um, we actually worked with the city uh, to get her a workforce development grant because one of the things that we have to get people off the treadmill of poverty, if we teach them for free, which we have been willing to do, and we work with great progressive employers like Google and IBM and Atlassian here in Austin, Texas, providing diversity scholarships. So, but even if we can educate them for free, and we have a lot of great corporations that are helping finance um, uh, diversity and inclusion into our, um, into our campuses, they have to find a way to stay alive while they're doing that, right? They have to pay the rent. They have to put food on their plates. And we're, try, we're actually working on with other foundations and our own foundation to provide cost of living assistance in addition to the sort of financial aid, if you will, to make sure they can actually have access to the education. It looks like your courses cost anywhere from 16 grand to people pay out of pocket. Um, yes, a lot of people do private pay. And um, our courses do start at about sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars, and the our master's program, which is a year long, is forty-eight thousand dollars. And um, uh, a lot of folks do private pay. And back in two thousand twelve and two thousand thirteen, when we launched Galvanize, um, the holy grail was still in the education world: was how do you get a credit mechanism, right? How do you get accreditation to get access to Title IV? We didn't have access to Title IV. We didn't have accreditation. We just aligned our interests with our students and worked with industry to solve the problem. But if you fast forward now what, where we're at and today, an entire credit industry has grown up overnight to solve this problem. And these are massive, massive players. Companies called Affirm, Earnest, Climb with a Y. A great one here by uh, uh, an entrepreneur named Rick O'Donnell uh, built a company called Skills Fund. There's an entire credit mechanism by which these inst credit institutions are giving students credit to pay for it. And, and uh, the interesting thing about what's going on here 
is skills fund actually is underwriting us, not the individual students. So if you get accepted into Galvanize, you get the same interest rate, whether you have a 300 credit score or an 800 credit score, you actually get the same credit rate based on our ability to deliver a successful outcome to you. Um, pretty fascinating um, uh, economic model that's transformed uh, this, entire, uh, this entire industry. Could you reach people sooner in the education tra trajectory? That's a great question. And um, if anybody saw Max speak about alt school a minute ago, he showed a picture with two of his kids on his chest. And uh, I have three children. And so we are very focused on, as, as I like to say, we, we, we solve the people after they've come off the assembly line, after they've been through the system and end up unemployed, underemployed, or unhappily employed. I am very, very passionate because I have a 12-year-old, um, a nine-year-old, and a five-year-old. Can we tilt um, uh, the trajectory further downstream through K through 12? We have had a handful of students come directly out of high school. Again, that's the minority. Um, whether we are currently set up to be the right mechanism, it depends on their sort of social emotional development. But I do think we will build longer programs and look to build more, swing the aperture earlier to give people more hope and opportunity. So tomorrow night we're doing, I'm sorry, on Sunday night for Interactive, we're hosting a big tech inclusion event with Megan Smith, the CTO of the United States. And a big part of, I sat down with Megan two weeks ago at our San Francisco campus, and it's all about inclusion. And part of that inclusion is about building awareness early. And I feel, unfortunately, for many youth today that are in high school, the number one reason you drop out is because you don't have hope, right? For so many people in this world, going to some elite institution is not even part of their psyche, right? It is not anything they intend to do. So they're going to end up in a services job or worse if they don't think there is a future. So I think part of the solution with Megan was they, the, in obviously Obama passed computer science for all, $4 billion. There needs to be awareness. First, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So how do we start putting awareness and education to high school students that there is another calling, that you don't have to uh, go to some four-year elite institution to have a great upward path to mobility? And I am, am hopeful that um, we can um, successfully start to move more and more in that way. Um, right now, um, at scale, you know, we're going to be able to do a lot more things. So in Austin, in Denver, and a lot of the, in San Francisco, we work with a lot of hackers club in high school. So most of what we do right now is outreach, and we do it, um, you know, we just do it as our community service um, to inspire youth and allow them. Like we ran Hack Days on our San Francisco campus a lot, across a lot of last year, and uh, we'll do the same here in Austin, Texas. 97% placement rate for graduates. What's your graduation rate? Um, it's funny, uh, we don't really think about graduation rates because everyone graduates. Um, uh, usually we might lose one person uh, per cohort. Typically a class is anywhere from 27 to 30 students. And uh, if one ends up leaving the program, it's typically because of some circumstance uh, out of our control, family death, uh, illness, um, things like that. But we don't really think about it like traditional higher ed, like everybody graduates. As a career counselor, I believe not everyone will go into data science or software engineering. Where will these people go to school when higher, school when higher ed implodes? Where will they go when higher ed implodes? Um, I guess we'll all just hang out in Austin and listen to music. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think, I think many people are inspired. I think we were raising generations that want to be entrepreneurs, and there needs to be more outlet to grow them and, and, and support them. And um, yes, I also don't believe everyone is made out to be a software engineer um, or data science. The beauty is, is even inside of our program, the tech-adjacent market and the data-adjacent market is huge. It's just like if you go to medical school, not everyone is going to turn into an MD or a heart surgeon, right? But there are a myriad of professions that come off of that expertise or you go off that journey into some level of specialization, whether it be in different fields of medicine, whether it be practitioners or nurse practitioners, et cetera. The same thing goes in, in the tech world, right? There's digital marketing, there's product marketing, there's growth hacking, there's product management, there's design, there's user design, there's digital marketing, there's, there's a whole genre of skill sets by which everyone, uh, the depth of jobs is unbelievable. 
Do you think we'll see an oversaturation of science and engineering careers, ready workforce? What will happen to arts and humanities? Um, I do not think in anyone's lifetime in this room we will see uh, supply ever catch up to demand in terms of the human capital required for skill sets. I think the actual number just in Austin alone, I think is there's 500,000 open jobs. There's millions of jobs going in and as more and more organizations continue to become tech companies, uh, the demand will continue to outpace the ability to deliver it. So to put it in perspective, um, I think the entire boot camp industry, quote unquote, immersive industry, graduated about 17,000 um, uh, graduates. I think computer science majors across every school in the United States, someone correct me if I'm factually incorrect, I think it's under 50,000, I think it's about 47,000. So let's put that in perspective with the, literally, there, the Bureau of Labor Statistics says there's more than 2.4 million open tech-related jobs right now. I don't think we're putting even a dent in it. Our ability to teach less about 2,000 students this year doesn't even come close to the, uh, to the opportunity and demand. And that's not even to mention a big part of what we're seeing right now is a lot of our great employers, IBMs and all states of the world, if you've been following some of our press, they're not just hiring our, our new talent, we're spending a great deal of time helping modernize their existing engineer. If you go to some of these large organizations, they have engineering bases like at American Express and Allstate, they've been engineers for 15 plus years. As they're putting in modernized compute technology, these platforms as a service, they want to retrain and modernize their existing engineers. So not only can they, do we, will we not supply enough for the demand, there's gonna be a huge opportunity to modernize and retrain existing workforce. Massive. Um, next. We all know the stereotype, thanks Winston, uh, of the nerdy coder who struggles to empathize with their non-technical peers. How do you prepare co coders to be effective educators? That's a great, um, that's a great question. So first I wanna talk about um, the stereotype. That's sort of programming culture and this back of the room nerd that just sits quietly and sits at a keyboard all day. That's not what software engineering is about anymore. Um, building software is a creative endeavor. It's a dual endeavor. So we teach agile pair development programs. So if you go into a modern agile software development environment today, there are two people sitting side by side working together as a team. And the most successful ones understand they're able to communicate business and business skill sets and work directly with the product manager. Why is that happening? So the first wave of technology, we all just thought was a commodity. We'd have smart people in the United States come up with business ideas and business insights, and then we shipped it out anywhere we possibly could to the cheapest labor in the world. And guess what came back? Mostly not what you wanted. And now that everyone's a tech company, the people that can enable the tech insight with the business insight must be as close to the business as possible. So you need communicative, business understanding minded people that are working in agile, test driven, paired programming. To use another big financial services company, this other company is working to try to bring 18,000 jobs that are in India outshored, and they're trying to move them to 4,000 jobs as pair programmers in Phoenix, Arizona right now. This is happening all over the place. So in general, um, building software is creative. And can we go back to the question? I didn't, I an answered it high level and I wanted to get to the very specific part. Can you bring that one back up? Or it disappeared. Um, anyway, I missed the punchline on that. I started at the high level and I wanted to get exactly to the, to the point of, uh, of the problem. The, the stereotype is going away, and the best institutions are not are hiring creative, resourceful, business-minded people that work in paired, agile programming. And I'd love to show you pictures of how we do it. That's actually how we teach our classes. All of them are in labs in paired programming. Even our data science is taught the same way, because a lot of what data science is, is the intersection of stats, um, engineering, mathematics, and being able to communicate the insights from all of them. And we teach the same methodology in this paired lab format. Um, do you partner with higher ed institutions? We do, indeed. Um, we have probably one of the most innovative program, uh, the first one ever in terms of uh, our partnership with the University of New Haven, where we literally teach a joint curriculum, our faculty or their faculty, masters of data science in, on our San Francisco campus. 
and um, we are working with some other great institutions uh, that are local to a lot of our campuses. So we're opening up a campus this fall in Phoenix, so we're working with a great school. We're working on some really neat things, hopefully with a great school down there that you probably all know. Um, the EQUIP program, um, I think a lot of that with the Department of Education with Ted Mitchell and David and team really want to inspire more partnerships and um, we're working potentially with a great one uh, here in Austin. Um, we're working with the University of Denver in Denver. I'm just talking about the ones I can talk about. But we see a huge opportunity to be the intermediary, to be that last mile, to do what we can't teach the humanities, right? We're not gonna teach the humanities. We teach a real world messy environment where working and learning are combined, but we're not letting them explore, explore in a vocational environment where higher ed can teach the humanities like they can. And we wanna partner with those schools and see a huge opportunity to be building lots of partnerships with traditional, um, traditional schools. We got about uh, five minutes left, eight minutes, seven minutes left. Degree programs have become fiscally non-sustainable. Should we intercept the student prior to wasting money on traditional degrees? Um, you know, I think there are many paths. Uh, I think there would be many paths to success. I don't want to, I don't think we should throw the baby all the way gone with the bathwater, but I do think education needs to be fractionalized. The bundling of all these electives and inefficiency of a four-year degree, I do not think, um, uh, I think will continue to, to break down. Education should be, the opportunity to be curious and explore should happen in an unbundled format that you have to commit to a major and a set of electives um, uh, that put you down a particular path I don't, I don't think are, are sustainable. Um, where do you find your faculty? Do you have a training program for them? That is a great question. And um, building our faculty was one of the most things I'm very, very proud of and one of the things that was incredibly challenging. Because as I said, you can't just take a practitioner. You can't have a bunch of instructional designers write great curriculum and then go find a practitioner and bring them in to teach it. One, you can't control quality like some of our competitors. But two, just because you're a great practitioner doesn't mean you're a, a, a great teacher. And we define, we are really trying to set the standard for what we call a 21st century scholar. Somebody that's able to stay current with industry, but is really someone that's dedicated and built themselves and loves the high they get from helping someone achieve and learn. And that comes from very, very special people. And what we've uh, learned, we're working on some pretty cool things with TFA. We've taken, um, most of our folks come from, a lot of them come from industry that have some teaching slant or background and have found it as their vocation. But we also got lucky and had some TFA alumni come through our programs that wanted an industry change. And then they said, wow, we really wanna teach this now. So we're almost looking backwards and saying, can we find great teachers and then teach them the very specific tech skills and turn them into amazing faculty? And so far, we've actually proven some really neat things there. We have a couple on our staff that are astounding, and we're hoping to do that at uh, scale. But we do employ all of our faculty, our full-time faculty. Um, in terms of scale, having almost 80 full-time faculty now, we're probably one of the largest data science and computer, computer science faculties uh, in the country that are full-time on staff. But we also build teaching pods that allow, now that we have the critical mass, the business model innovation here was how do you actually not put people in the classroom again where they're stuck um, sparring and they're getting stale. As our team likes to say, they, wanna, they don't wanna just spar, they actually wanna go fight in a ring still. So we allow them to rotate alpha teaching pod and they can work on industry projects that we do for free. Think of it like pro bono work. So we take on work from Disney or IBM or GE, and we'll take on a project that our, our faculty get to work on real world projects to keep industry fresh and current. And um, that's uh, not an easy thing to, to sort of solve for. And uh, we're really proud of, um, of that sort of innovation as well. Is, all, is it all in person or do you do also do online instru instruction? Everything is on campus right now. We have built a bunch of flipped classroom assets that uh, guide our curriculum or what we call our, our workbook. Um, but everything is on campus on all of our campuses. So it's faculty full time on our campuses in, in, in all of our markets. Do you find companies give a preference to a student who has a four-year degree, even if they have the same ability skills as those students without a degree? That's a great question for our outcomes team, and I think in general, there are com some companies that really still will build that stratification and what will leave that requirement in, and clearly, we don't work with them. But 
we have a couple hundred partners that hire our students now, and it feels to me that more and more are adopting the sort of same idea I had in the mid-2000s that a degree didn't really tell me anything about their proficiencies or competencies or their willingness to be successful in, my, in our organization. But I'm sure there's still plenty of companies out there that don't. Um, one of the hardest ones to work with, actually, uh, true story, is um, American Express that recruits from Harvey Mudd, um, Stanford, et cetera, and their big hiring manager was very, very, um, uh, let's say, skeptical of what we would do. And one of our students, actually, we said, look, why don't you try to hire some of our graduates? We have a class gra graduating right now. They hired um, an awesome young man named Cameron. I don't know if Cameron's in the room. He's one of our students who's actually now in Austin right now, and a young woman named Miji. And they did it as part of their recruitment from all the Ivy League schools. And Cameron and Miji blew them away, um, not just with their technical proficiencies, but because of the, how they work and learn on our campus, where they're surrounded by other entrepreneurs and by IBM's Blue Mix Garage and other industry and engineers, they are getting sort of that well-rounded learning that you learn leadership and collaboration skills in a way that you wouldn't in just some sort of lectured environment. And Cameron and Miji is, have excelled, and I, that company, you know, Amex has now hired you know, dozens um, of, our, of our students. Um, all right, is there anything super upvoted? Because I'm gonna answer one more, and then we can all get about our um, Austin uh, festivities here. Uh, everyone graduates, completes the program, but are they graded? Are they at the same level competencies when they complete it? Um, I'm, gonna end on, I'm gonna end on this one, and I'd love to answer more questions um, either over email, jimmcgalvanize.com, or afterwards if anybody wants to ask me any questions. Our full stack software program um, actually is tracking about 130 competencies right now. So we built a tool, we call it Flight, where our employers like Allstate can log in and look at our students and they can look at 130 different competencies and their level of mastery within each of those competencies. And yes, I, you know, not every, all, when 30 students come in, not everybody is set out to be a heart surgeon or an MD. Some are more suited to be in a tech adjacent role. So, you know, that heart surgeon in our world, I'll use the Pivotal Labs example. Some are gonna be amazing Pivotal Labs, the Navy SEALs of engineers. Some are gonna be amazing Facebook data scientists. Some will realize that their vocation isn't necessarily being in a paired programming environment, but they'll be a technical sales leader at Pivotal Labs. And, um, but two real innovations here is that we're building, um, a set of, uh, we're building a set of tools called Flight that we can look at 130 different competencies. We're building a soft skill heuristic, and we have a whole bunch of data scientists that can start collecting attributes from the employers that we can start literally doing a data-driven analysis based on competencies, soft skill heuristics, and the employer attributes to know exactly who is the right, who will be successful at a different level of employer. And that's, I mean, and if you can do that, plus get credit and, and or, uh, matriculation for your degree at University of Denver or some other school, um, and have a combination where a university partner starts their, you know, student starts their education at a university and then comes to galvanize in San Francisco or Austin to finish the last mile and we give them those competencies and access to their dream jobs. I think that's a super duper cool win-win-win, right? Where higher ed is still relevant, galvanize is relevant, and most importantly, the student and consumer wins big time. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very, very much for listening to me talk for an hour.